Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Film Frauds, where myself, Matt, and Mark. Hello. And Tyler. Hello. Provide a completely unprofessional, 100% biased opinions on movies of today, tomorrow, and yesteryear. And today we're continuing with part two of our director's series of Paul Thomas Anderson. Mark, what movie are we talking about today? We are talking about Paul Thomas Anderson's fourth film, Punch Drunk Love, which came out in yeah. 2002. And um, yeah, it's, it's I chose one. Yeah, 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 it was. Uh, I ch- this is the film he made after Magnolia. Um, so I chose this film because uh, this is the director for, that I chose for this series. Um, and this is a film that I personally love. Um, and so I'll just talk about my experience uh, with this film so far. Uh, and I've seen it three times now. Uh, the first time I saw it was earlier this year. And I wasn't really into my like movie phase quite yet. I was on like HBO, just scrolling through the options, and I, I saw this punch drunk coaster phase. Yeah, I was in my, <laughs> yeah. Before I, when I was uh, a disgrace to Scorsese, um, and I was just <laughs> what? shut up, <laughs> shut up. He's talking about Pacific Rim. <laughs> Today um, we cancel the apocalypse. <laughs> All right, you know what? I, I changed my mind. This is a Pacific Rim review. All right, yes. <laughs> yes. Well, I haven't seen it. So. Yes. <laughs> Wait, you still haven't seen Pacific Rim? Oh, no, I did see it, but I was really bored, and I kind of had my, I was on my phone most of the time. All right, I'm going fi- to fight you on that later. <laughs> yeah. okay. I'll, remember, I'll remember that the next time I see you in person. All right. Um, so I, I saw Punch Drunk Love available, and I was like, oh, isn't this like the Adam Sandler movie where he, like, punches things? And so I, I, I just, like, clicked on it, and I think the only thing I knew going in was that he, like, punches those windows, those three windows uh, at that party, and that was it. And so... Um, I watched it and I was fucking blown away. I I really I just I absolutely could not believe what I was watching and um, I felt like I could float after I watched it. You know, you get that that movie high, like that's yeah. that's what I had after the first time I watched it. Um, and I think like at the time when I watched it, it was like my second favorite film ever. Um, number one being The Lighthouse, which since it's you know way, moved way up my list, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, so then I watched it again in May of this year, like two or three months after the first time I watched it. Didn't like it as much. Um, for some reason, just overall, it did not have the exact same effects it had on me on the first time of watching it. Um, I was a little more aware of the, the camera movements and how it sort of matched the, the story that was being told. Um, and then I watched it again last night for the third time, and I had a much better experience than my second time. I liked it a lot more. Um, not quite the first time, um, but what I was most aware of on this uh, on this third time was the colors, because um, it's just white, red, and blue through the whole film, and then a conglomeration of all all three of those, and it was it was a much more you know visually rich experience. I guess uh, that's the best way I could say it. And so, you know, overall this film, I just I I love it. I think for me, it's my favorite from Paul Thomas Anderson. Second being probably Boogie Nights. Um, wow. So that's, that's my experience with the film. I know, Matt, you've seen it twice now. Yep. Uh, let me know your thoughts. So the first time I saw it, I was like, I don't get this at all. Um, I don't remember. I think it was like early high school. So probably like six, seven years ago when I saw it. Um, and I don't know what I was expecting. Um, I think it was the first Paul Thomas Anderson movie I had seen at the time. And I don't know, like, I didn't really remember much of it. And I just remember being really bored. I watched it again last night and I liked it a lot more the second, the second time. I think I got, like, I found the movie to be really, really funny. Um, especially, like, it's, it's not like, not like a laugh out loud movie, kind of consistent laugh out loud movie, but like a lot of um, Adam Sandler's, I appreciated Adam Sandler's um, tone and his, his uh, like the subtle humor in it. Like it, it's, they're, they're not really jokes, it's just, it's just you laughing at um, Adam Sandler's performance um, because he plays this man with severe psychological problems and um, some of his interactions are, are very subtly funny. I think that's what makes him mm-hmm. even more funny is because he doesn't really yeah. put much emphasis on them. Um, I don't think this movie is perfect by any, by any means. I think that um, it's too short, which is something weird for me because I love short movies. Um, and I don't think it's anywhere near as good as Boogie Nights, which, I, which we just saw for the first episode of our podcast. But I would say that I'm starting to understand Paul Thomas Anderson a lot more thanks to doing mm-hmm. this podcast because before I had seen a lot of his movies and... I appreciate them, but not really clicking. But now, like with Boogie Nights and 
having rewatched Punch Drunk Love, he's finally starting to click for me. And um, I definitely am glad I rewatched it. Uh, I'm kind of in a weird boat. So this is my first time watching it, but I, I knew about this movie for a long time when I was in early high school and I was getting into movies or I started to realize that movies could be more than just like the Man of Steel kind of type or it's just a lot of action and not a lot There's of more substance. than just Man of Steel types of movies? That, no, you're right. That's an excellent point. <laughs> the I don't movies know why. That, that are more colors than just gray? I don't know Zach what I'm doing. Snyder here, invented movies. This isn't Man of Steel <laughs> review. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but I, I always kind of like, I didn't really know who Paul Thomas Anderson one, but, was, but I knew who Adam Sandler was. I mean, at the time when I was getting into early high school, Jack and Jill was the big kind of like joke movie to make fun of. And everyone was like, oh, Jack and Jill. I was like, what's joke? It's so funny. It's like, she, she, <laughs> Why do I want to coke all of a sudden? <laughs> she sits on a horse <laughs> and breaks its legs. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. But no, then I, I mean, I always knew about it, but it was also no, another one of those movies that I just never really bothered to watch. And then Paul, I started watching Paul Thomas Anderson movies, and this was kind of one I wanted to check out. Um, my first thoughts are, it's good, but I think it has issues. And I think I agree with Matt, and because Matt and I, this is actually gonna be a point of mine. But Matt and I are big proponents of the ninety-minute movie. And if you can get a, if you can get everything down concise in ninety minutes, that's like the best time of my life. Like, this movie like desperately needed an extra 15, 20 minutes, um, which again is really weird to think but the movie ended and i went i wanted more i and i think a lot of my issues with this movie come with the relationship in it i i think it's and again matt and i if you want to uh, get a good example of this matt and i are also big proponents of a well-developed relationship all you have to do is see our handmaiden and wrestler review to get an idea that that's one of our kind of biggest compliments is a believable relationship we don't and, have developed relationships in our real life in our exactly. real life so, so we, we kind of need them in movies <laughs> to yeah. understand what it's like to feel something for we, other we, people we live uh, vicariously we went you would call us psychopaths <laughs> yeah. so i was um, like i gotta go yeah i gotta go i gotta go i gotta go talk to someone <laughs> um no, this is, it's definitely, I think it's like woefully underdeveloped and it's, it doesn't do service to how well this movie's directed and crafted. It just, that's like, since that's the main crux of the story and it doesn't work, a lot of stuff kind of falls flat. And I, and, and I think it desperately needs an extra 15 minutes that to establish the relationship and to kind of establish why these characters like each other. And I, I think looking at it, I also have one more kind of like, complain about it that's hard to describe and i don't know if you guys felt this or not but i'll talk about it later but it's a really it's like it doesn't make a lot of sense and it probably won't make any sense and i'm gonna get laughed at so but this is my first time seeing it and i must say i mean paul thomas anderson movies are like the cream of the crop all of his movies are great and even this one which i like a lot but this is probably my least favorite one i've seen so far but that's not saying that's not me going it's a bad movie that's me going you're saying he oh, hates it. I hate it. It's like Man of Steel. Um, no, it's like <laughs> it's the Man of Steel of it's the Man God. of Steel of Paul Thomas Anderson. Oh, <laughs> Man, I'm really it's Adam so, Sandler's yeah, worst movie. Yeah. I'm gonna get voted <laughs> off film frauds now. There are a lot of devoted people in this movie. But again, me saying it's my least favorite Paul Thomas Anderson movie is like Matt. You mentioned that Bong Joon Ho movies are all A's for you. That's basically like the vast majority of um, mm. Paul Thomas Anderson movies for me. But I don't know. Um, but for our director series, we talk about the director and kind of stuff like that. Uh, but I feel like on this one, we should probably talk a little bit about Adam Sandler. Um, yeah. Kind of what yeah. he means to us. Because this is like a really – because this is coming right off the heights of his like two – his big like comedy introductions like Happy Gilmore, uh, Billy Madison. And then all of a sudden it's 2000 – Waterboy, yes. And then all of a sudden it's 2002. And then Paul Thomas Anderson said he really wants to work with Daniel Day-Lewis and Adam Sandler. Mm-hmm. And then he worked with both of them. And this is probably his best performance. Um, I think subtly, Uncut Gems is a different kind of animal. I feel yeah, like it's a different I type of movie. Yeah, I might have two better performances, in my opinion. Two better. I, I, yeah, I, I think uh, this is my favorite performance from Adam Sandler. I just, I love how reserved he is. And then yeah. completely unreserved he is <laughs> yeah. in this film. Um, so yeah, continue, Tyler. No, I'm just, I, I think it's an interesting because, again, we didn't grow up in the heights of, like, SNL when he was on there. And then when he kind of rose to popularity with his, like, early, late 90s, early 2000s classics. So we, we know him as kind of that actor who pays to go on vacations with his friends and make terrible movies. Yeah, and right. then occasionally turns out, like, a funny people 
or an Uncut Gems or Punch Drunk Love or Mayerowitz Ma- 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 stories. Yeah, the Noah Baumbach one. Yeah, the Noah Baumbach one. Um, so we kind of know him as like a, this weird, interesting, kind of like terrible comedic actor. And then I probably like this when we were kids. What? Like, that we, at least I yeah, liked when I was a kid. Yeah, but well, like, yeah. I loved The Water Boy when I was younger, but it's also like, yeah. it's The Water Boy going, knowing, hey, this is like a very early Adam Sandler. He's not this good anymore. Like, I just want to, I just want to point this out. He did Little Nicky right before Punch Drunk Love. Have you seen Little Nicky? Did he really? It's I like have. the worst I movie. Oh my god. He's terrible in it. That's so funny. What did he do right after Punch Drunk Love? He did Mr. Deeds, which is also terrible. Oh my god. Oh, <laughs> well, Eight Crazy Nights, that that terrible animated movie. But yeah, I would say um his earlier like i still i kind of find his earlier early work to be kind of charming in a way like i like billy madison and happy game work they're just so stupid yeah yeah but there's like there's 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 like there's like something kind of interesting about it not interesting mm-hmm. but there's like there's like a style to it he's got charisma he's yeah, got yeah. Like the comedic he has charisma. charisma he's trying it's, it's not like um the do-over or something it's not just yeah or, or that crap but then i also i think um wedding singer is like a legitimately really good movie Really, um, Drew Barrymore. Like, I legitimately really enjoy that movie. Okay. It's probably one of my favorite romantic comedies. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but I've seen parts of it when I was. He's younger. so funny. Like when he sings um, "Love Stinks," <laughs> 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 that's that seems so funny. But I would say, like, out of good like quality Adam Sandler performances from all of his movies, I would say "Wedding Singer" is up there. "Punch Drunk Love," and I'd say his best two are probably um, um, uh, "The Gems," "Uncut Gems," and um, the other one, which is. Can we? Name. Can I throw um, out? Wait, wait. I just want to. I want to. I want to say one one thing. Okay, because I have. I, I have an underrated Adam Sandler. Movie. Funny people. Funny people. Yeah, he's great. I have. I had a personal uh, grudge against Adam Sandler because uh, <laughs> the weekend Pacific Rim came out. Okay, <laughs> I I love Pacific Rim. It's one of my favorite movies. Just in general. I mean, like, like it's not like on my top ten list, but it's like a guilty pleasure film for me. Um, that was the same weekend Grown Ups 2 came out, okay? That's where Adam Sandler Oh, my God. Gr- Grown Ups 2 grossed more in the opening weekend than Pacific Rim, and I thought this, I was like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> the American audiences don't know what they want. I cannot believe this happened. I hate you, Adam Sandler, for making this film. Pacific Rim is art, cuts to art. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Ah! <laughs> yeah. uh, I just want to throw out that I, I will die for click. I think Click is great. Oh my god! I, I well, there is a scene in Click when he gets really old. Okay, Click is really stupid because it's all a dream at the end and it doesn't matter. But there are like mm-hmm. legitimately good moments of Click, and he's good in parts of Click. And I will mm-hmm. die I think he has a belly for flap, and he's just going like that. Yeah, yeah. So belly there's... flap will do what I want with it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there are parts of Click when he's like old and he's like reflecting on his life, and I'm like, this is a damn good movie, and yeah. I'll die for Click. Yeah, I was, like, why am I, have I was like, why am I 10 years old and having an existential crisis yeah. in this movie? <laughs> have you seen Funny People? I have seen Funny People. Yeah, that's that was kind of... Apito, right? Yeah. Okay. Seth Rogen. Remember we were talking about good Seth Rogen movies? Yeah. Last Funny podcast? I, would start, I should have mentioned that because I, I, I think the movie is really, I think he's really, really good in that movie too. So Adam Sandler, oh. like, every once in a while. So we had 2002 with uh, Paul Thomas Anderson. Then we go to... 1998 with Wedding Singer. 1998 with Wedding Singer, sorry. Who, uh, and then we go to, what, 2007, 2008, 2009 with Judd Apatow, Funny People. Then we go to Mayerowitz Stories with Noah Baumbach and then Safety Brothers with Uncut Gems. So he can make, he's a very competent actor. He can make good movies. So why, like, so, like, what happened? Like, because Punch Drunk Love is just, like, it's this awakening. Like, it's like, oh, my God, Adam Sandler can act. I don't know, what did you guys think? Like, yeah, I'm kind of like, you're, I guess, you're conceived. I guess he sees it as, like, a, just as a career, I guess. I don't know. He's not, I don't know if he's, like, I remember hearing a quote from him. I know you sort of just alluded to it a, a few minutes ago, Tyler. And it was like, he likes making movies where like he can go on vacation and do it. Yep. Like he likes to go to like Hawaii and do like 50 first dates or whatever that, that film was. Is that, yeah. is that the one he's in? Yeah. yeah where the, him and Jennifer Aniston. She has a need no, 50 first dates is when he dates Drew Barrymore oh, because she has oh. brain damage. You can only remember things after one day. So she dates him, he dates her every day. <laughs> And then eventually they get married right. and she wakes up every morning and there's just a guy looking at the read through. <laughs> and then she's in love with him by the time she wakes up and do you think? Them. Do you think she wakes up it's one beautiful. day? Shut up. Do you think there's a point one day where he just like plops down a 500 page scrapbook? She's like, I don't want to fucking read this. I don't want to do this. Yeah. 
the last scene is, oh. is is they're on like a boat they're like they're, they're out in the middle of the ocean when she wakes up and she's just like she has this huge she watches like this video of their life and then wakes up and she's like i love you I'm so what, if, what if she gets scared and kicks him off the boat at the end and then he <laughs> drowns and that's 50 first dates that was that was a day after the lap, the end because they're still gonna be on the ocean still gonna forget so okay oh that makes yeah. sense yeah i don't know it's just like because we know we again we grew up we have watched uncut gems all together in theaters and we're like damn adam sandler's great why didn't he do this more and then you go back and you're like damn adam sandler it was great why mm-hmm. didn't he do this and i think it's a really interesting like kind of vehicle to look this through and this is ultimately i'm just gonna bring this up now uh, this is ultimately like a weird critique but not a critique i have about the movie but paul thomas anderson is very much known for being kind of like an actor's director he very much can like control over the set and get actors to kind of like do what they want even when you have kind of like examples of actors clashing with uh pta if you look at like burt reynolds and boogie nights this was the first time i've ever felt like a clash between like a pta movie and like an actor's movie like it felt very much like a fight between who is in control of the movie like is this an adam sandler vehicle point out like specific moments i don't really i i can't like it's just like it felt like there were often times it was like catering to Adam Sandler's like strengths rather than Paul Thomas Anderson's strengths. It doesn't make any sense, but there's like it's like a kind of like maybe it's just him as an actor or personality, but he felt like he was kind of like dominating the movie over what Paul Thomas Anderson does. And if you watch something like Magnolia, which I watched for the first time last night, you have like the world's greatest, like at the time, like the megastar Tom Cruise in the movie, but he is giving a performance that still feels kind of like within a paul thomas anderson movie it doesn't seem to like elevate and take over and become a tom cruise movie this one it's a weird critique and it's not necessarily a critique but Mm. i felt like there was a clash that's so interesting to say that because i feel like i understand that i was more reserved in this movie than he has ever been Um, really like like, i'll point out a scene because i said earlier that i like the subtlety of the humor in it like so like you get throughout the movie that he's very um He's very like anal retentive like, and yep. he's very busy minded and stuff. And then when he's talking to the girl, um, Lena, yep. and he's he's like, and then there's like a forklift accident going on yep. in the back. And then Lena's like, uh, there's a there's a problem over there. You should be looking at it. He goes, Oh no, it's fine. He goes, No, yeah. really, it's a problem. And he knocks on the door. He goes, Is everything okay? Okay, then he goes back to the conversation. Like I <laughs> yeah, was yeah, yeah. dying during that scene because it's yeah, yeah. it's so subtle. I don't know. I I don't see that. I think I feel the opposite actually. I think that he i feel like i think adam sandler works because he feels like he's in it he feels like he's in a ball time sanderson movie um i would say that in a way um it doesn't feel like a ball time sanderson movie because when i think of like no country i mean i mean um there will be blood Blood. or um bookie nights you think of like a lot of characters all in one movie that all have unique distinct feelings and in this movie i only feel like adam sandler has like the only is the only character with with like the amount of depth that you'd expect from Paul Thomas Anderson movie, so I would say that maybe, but maybe that's what you're thinking of. But I don't, I don't think that Paul, I don't think that Adam Sandler is like, is like taking over the movie by any means. So I found a quote from Paul Thomas Anderson, and this could very much like disprove what I'm talking about. But he basically, when he refers to this movie, calls it an Adam Sandler art house film, which would make sense. I don't know. It it might have been. Listen, this is probably going to be a movie that my opinion might fluctuate a little bit on subsequent viewings. I mean, Mark, you said yourself from viewing to viewing, you've basically kind of like done a U shape in terms of your opinion. And Matt, you've gone only yeah. up after, and this was my first time watching it, knowing absolutely, I knew nothing about this movie. I, I really didn't know anything about the characters. I just knew it was a Paul Thomas Anderson movie and it was Adam Sandler in it. So maybe like watching it and kind of expecting it and being able to kind of view it through a, like an already kind of like a, like a knowledgeable lens about Paul Thomas Anderson finishing his filmography. I might, I might kind of like be able to like the movie a little bit more. Uh, but I do think there are elements that I don't think will be better on subsequent viewings. Again, like I said, I think the, the romance in this is horribly underdeveloped. I, I think there's no substance to it. And it's a really weird, considering Adam Sandler's character, it's kind of like very volatile and like very quick to anger. And then mm-hmm. like putting those together. And again, we're also viewing this from like a lens in like 2020 when it was a movie made in 2002. Um, but it really feels like kind of like a, the makings of like an unhealthy relationship already. It's just weird. It's like it felt like a really weird dynamic to me. I don't know like what you guys thought. Like we like we can well, eventually transition into the movie and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, sort of going back a little bit. Uh, 
I, I'm sure you might, you guys might have read this somewhere, but I think Paul Thomas Anderson, like in regards to his screenplays, he tries to make it as bare bones as possible to give the actors as much room as they can. And yeah. I think Adam Sandler just really capitalized on that fact. And, um, you know, in regards to the, the relationship, I guess there are certain aspects of it where it could be deemed, you know, unbelievable or, you know, hard to get into. But I really wasn't concerned about it when I, when I watched the film. Um, it's sort of like the last thing on my mind. It's, uh, yeah, it really wasn't, really wasn't an issue for me. I mean, there's like that one moment where she confronts him, like, you know, you left me in the hospital. But that and, even like you know. results in him. There's, I just feel like this movie needs an extra 15, 20 minutes. And this is, I feel like it needs those 15, 20 minutes to establish that despite Adam Sandler having clear faults in his character, like quick to anger, or quick to violent anger, they're still kind of like, they need that few times, they need a few scenes where despite that, and despite us as an audience knowing that, he can like, he has charm and he kind of like, they laugh or kind of like uh, bond over a few different things. So then by the end, once like everything's coming together, there's that believability to it. Because for me, it feels like a very much, she was interested in him from a picture and then they go on one date and then they're like, that's it. Like they go to Hawaii together. And it felt like very like, I'm like, oh, whoa, like, hey, we know Adam Sandler has a lot of issues and they're not being explored how they could impact a relationship. Felt like they were kind of being ignored. I don't know what you guys thought. Yeah, now that you bring it up, um, I kind of agree with you. They could have... Yeah. Um, there's, there's like a sense that it's doomed to fail because you don't really get the feeling that Adam Sandler, um, is going to be overcome his issues. Like you get the feeling like he needs like actual psychological therapy to yep. like start getting better. Um, maybe we're looking at it with like, with too cynical of a, mm -hmm. of a lens, um, to a certain extent, like it didn't bother me in the moment when watching the movie, but now that you bring it up, it kind of bothers me. Um, it would have been interesting to see, um, him have some sort of like weird freak out with her being present. And then seeing, unless it happens, and we don't think it does happen. No, he goes off. Um, the only thing that's close is he goes off to the bathroom. Yeah. At, and he goes, and it's one of those things where we establish that he has this weird dynamic with his sisters. And it's clearly not healthy. And it's clearly yeah. off this kind of like overbearing kind of sense. And it's weighing on Because they're like, they're questioned because like sexuality, right? The start. Yeah. And it's like, it's so, they're, they're so mundane about it. And it, yeah. it's just, it makes it even more troubling because you get the feeling like as like a kid he was probably just tortured so they're just they're calling him like gay boy and stuff yeah like, just so casually and it's you can just tell like that they're probably the source of a lot of his issues but we have that we have that thing where they they ask him about it when he goes to the party and he kicks the windows and breaks yeah. them all but then we we then cut and see where she mentions it mentions the incident when they were a kid when he broke a window with a hammer and he, she mentions it once and then he goes to the bathroom and destroys a bathroom yeah. absolutely wrecks it and you're watching this and at least for me it was like one of those things it's like how is this relationship going to work how are they going to yeah. address this how there are they could have been a scene where he's like about to freak out and then somehow she calms him so then you get yeah. in your mind like oh she brings him some sort of there, peace kind of yeah. like kind of like uh sandman's daughter and sandman from spider-man 3 uh, <laughs> oh my oh when <laughs> yes you you <laughs> reference spider-man 3 is a good thing Oh my god. Okay, yeah, in Spider-Man 3 at the beginning where he's trying to piece himself together with the sand yeah. and he views the locket and then yes. it's like, Matt, you're my favorite person. Oh my yeah. god, this... <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, I mean, I would... Now that, you, now that you're bringing this up, I think that there really could have been a scene... Again, make this movie longer, add an extra 15 minutes to it, like somewhere in the middle um, have um, him freak out and have her... And like right, right, he's, right when he's about to get like physically violent, not against her, but against like a wall or something, have her show up or something or calm him down and then later on you understand why he's so like reliant on her after yeah. that because like he, it makes him feel better than he does with his sisters so, like, i just don't makes... know why this movie was so short because i mean Mag magnolia is legitimately double the length of this movie i mean uh, all his other movies are at least an hour longer than this <laughs> yeah it's, it's well one... i want to i want to interject real quick Go for uh, it. I, I think in regards to the relationship, I, I disagree with you guys. Um, I think you, you can sort of see her as the, as the cure, I guess, because there's that song playing throughout the film. It's like, he needs me, he needs me, you know? Okay. It's playing over and over again. It's like, she's his escape from this, like, this tortured life of, you know, work, loneliness, and his sisters that, you know, he can literally, like, literally escape 
both, both mm. figuratively and literally, you know, because he has the, the miles now and he can fly with her. And I think that's all you need. I mean, I guess you can say like, oh, what, you know, I have like an endless series of hypotheticals of like, how's this re relationship going to work, you know, after the, the film ends. But I think in regards to the condensed hour and a, hour and a half that we get, it works for me I, at least. I feel like then you need to have the case where then if, we, if we're going off this where we need to establish firmly that he is violent and temperamental or quick to temper rather, um, quick to anger when he's not with her. We have to establish that before if this is that's going to work. She's his escape. She's his cure. We establish that before, then but then we then we can't have a scene of anger when he's with her, which is the dinner scene in the bathroom where she brings up something and he takes out his anger on something else. We need to see that the difference between the two, and I think they're two blended together. Which again, it's kind of a, it's a realistic story. Paul Thomas Anderson is kind of known for having these realistic characters with issues, and they don't necessarily have a a very apparent growth from the beginning to the end, or it's a his movies are very known for having small character growth, but it's realistic character growth. You'll get something like a movie like Manchester by the Sea, where is a character who's grieving, and by the end you of mean the movie, the the sad for two hours. The, the sad movie. for two hours, Casey <laughs> Affleck movie, yeah. Um, Dead Family, Casey Affleck sad movie. Um, but you see him at the end, like he's still in in Manchester by the Sea. He's still grieving, but he makes little steps by kind of allowing someone else into his life, and that's what Paul Thomas Anderson does. We need to, there's no use of that in this movie. And that's why an extra 15, 20 minutes would do this movie wonders. Because we don't see that. It's, he's very much like yeah. the same person with and without her. So when we see him violent without her and violent with her, it doesn't, like, it's just, I feel like it creates this very, like, unbelievable, like, Matt, you said, the relationship is doomed to fail. And I feel like that when the movie ended, because it also has this very, like, story tell, story book kind of feel, this fantasy element to it. I feel like it's just doomed to fail. I don't know what you guys, I don't know, Mark, what you thought. Well, you're... the explosion in the bathroom happens on their first date. I mean, it's like r right at the beginning of the relationship. You yeah, know, they have like one other date, time. <laughs> Yeah, and then they go to Hawaii. Well, yeah, well, they go to, they go to Hawaii, and it's, um, I, I guess the case can be made for a, a scene where he's sort of controlling his temper, um, you know, once they sort of establish their relationship. Um, but... You know, after that point, after the, the bathroom freak out, like upon the mentioning of the, sis the story with the sisters, um, it just seems like, you know, the, the, anything regarding the sisters is like a trigger for him. And again, the, the literal escape at the end that they want to have is like, you know, that'll close that chapter, I guess, um, of just this, this temper, this horrible temperament that he has. Um, that, makes, that makes sense. And then he's very, he's protective of her at the end, especially when the brothers come. Yeah. And he just sense. sort of goes... He's actually kind of reserved in, in a sense because he just sort of gives the guy the, the crowbar and he's yeah. like, take this. And then he goes, well, he's reserved go. after he, you know, just decked the three guys. But yeah, yeah I understand. Well, they were going to beat the, they're going to beat the living hell out of him. I mean, what yeah, I know. But like, he was still, yeah, I get what you're saying. You're right. um, I think that's just, I think that's a good point because at the end, she does lie about where he is because he's in the hotel room together and she goes, did he ever call you? And he's sitting across on the bed and she's like, no, he never did. And they're like, he's like, oh, she, his sister's like, he's so weird. And so, so I get it. But I also feel like, as is his escape, but, okay, fine. She acts as his vehicle as escape from his sisters. Mm -hmm. but, but there isn't, an, I don't feel like enough, like in Phantom Thread, I don't know you guys have I haven't seen it. it. <laughs> I, haven't see, I won't say anything, but it's a movie very much about a relationship between two people. I won't say anything. Everyone dies. Everyone dies. It's miserable. <laughs> but it's a relationship, a, a, a very much codependent relationship between two people. And the movie spends the entire, the entire movie is, uh, is talk is uh, what's called developing that relationship the entire movie and so by the end of that phantom thread when stuff happens which again i won't spoil um it makes kind of sense because you have an entire movie of build up but that movie is also over two hours long so it's just kind of like i feel like i feel like i'm just gonna go round and round in circles i just think the movie's too short i think there's stuff that yeah we we're, we're kind of just been arguing in circles by this point yeah. um mark yeah. though this is one of your favorite movies uh, paul favorite paul thomas anderson movie what kind of stuff do you love about this because i have some stuff that's wonderful in this yeah well i think uh in the scope of paul thomas anderson's filmography you know outside of punch drunk love i feel like like I'm, I'm completely blown away by the filmmaking, the characters, the story, and everything. But like it has, I'm like, I feel like it lacks sort of this emotional heart that I can can connect to, like specifically like the the master, or um, I 
sort of Boogie Nights, uh, Heart Eight. Um, I, there will be blood, but not really because you're not supposed to sympathize. Uh, but like, this is a film that like, it, it's just, it has such a heart to it and it feels, the movie feels alive. And um, that's just like one aspect that I love. And uh, just the character of Barry Egan, um, I just love the way like, you know, how he, how the filmmaking of, of the movie matches his character. You got these at the beginning, you got like, um, you know, Barry walks out to the street. It's nice and calm, tranquil. And then you see the car coming and, and you see, you're watching it coming. You don't think much of it. You don't hear anything. And then all of a sudden, boom, car crash. Yeah. Couple Super jump scares loud. In this movie. Couple, Couple jump scares. Piano drops. And someone comes, drops the piano or the harmonium. And then, you know, cuts back to him and the, the thing. And then he goes back out and tranquil again. And then you see the truck coming, coming, no noise. And then it comes and then he like, Barry's freaking out. He's fleeing the scene of the crime with the, the harmonium. And it's just like, that's just like who he is. It's like calm explosion. And then he's like retreating or, you know, some, some form of that. And I just love that. Just the way, you know, the filmmaking matched the character. And um, I can go on longer, but like, tell me what you guys love about the film. Matt? I liked um, the way the music synced up to his, to his um, personality and like yeah. what he was feeling at the time. And like when he's, there's, right, so many, yeah. like, there's so many great long shots of him just doing work while he's getting calls and he's trying to sell things. Like the, it's a really mm-hmm. great scene in the beginning where he's selling the, the, the tube or whatever. And like the, the sisters keep calling. And like, as, as everything's going along, like, there's really like eccentric music is playing. Like there's all like weird, like breathing sounds and just mm-hmm. weird like instruments playing and there's no real yeah. melody to it. Um, what you think works and then when he when he's like he's like and then we're trying to test out the tube and he goes and it shatters he goes well that was one of the old ones and he's very embarrassed yeah. Yeah. Um, there's, it's kind of like um, kind of like Birdman in a way where the, um, the soundtrack is mixes with how the character's feeling I really appreciated that aspect and as I said earlier I, I just think that a lot of Adam Sandler's subtle acting is just hilarious at times um, mm-hmm. and I think like the ending kind of like fight is really is really funny and yeah. and fun yeah. in a way so i would say those are the things that really stuck out to me is stuff that i liked i don't know tyler uh i completely agree um there's that one element i'm going to compare this to my one of my favorite pieces of media ever bojack horseman um because in, in, punch- in i was in a very f- i'm gonna stop um <laughs> that was uh so in this movie like the what you're talking about that kind of like one long take scene well, the music's like uh, it's like erratic and it doesn't really feel like a score it but it, it's supposed to kind of, it feels like it's supposed to create a sense of kind of like anxiety and stress yeah. to, el- to uh, emulate what barry egan is feeling because people are coming in and it's an overloading of senses and bojack horseman has an episode like that where princess caroline has her baby and yeah. she's trying to do a bunch of stuff and it's just noise and noise and noise and it's like the ticking of clocks and everything that makes you anxious so when it stops and then it's silent and he has control of her situation you can kind of feel it and you can feel when he is in control based on the sound design and the score. And I love that touch. That is a Mm -hmm. wonderful, wonderful element because it happens a few times because stuff starts to happen and you can hear the uh, kind of like a haunting, like, cause that, uh, cause that element of the score where you get that one scene where it's just noise and noise and noise never comes back fully, but it comes back in little kind of subtle elements and, uh, or little subtle kind of uh, times where things start to become overwhelming. You hear little remnants of it coming through and then it stops when he has control and i really really dug that about the movie uh philip seymour hoffman's wonderful for like the three minutes he's in it yeah uh there's that great phone call at the end where he's just like fuck you fuck you fuck you and they're just yelling on opposite yeah. ends of the phone you're like this is yeah. awesome you're like this is yeah, what yeah. I'm for. i remember when philip seymour hoffman died i was like i didn't really know him as an actor yeah i just seen him in, in um catching fire so like i was like i was like <laughs> i don't oh, really, i was pretty indifferent like at the time and now I, I feel like as i watch more of his fall time santa movies i feel more sad yeah like <laughs> retroactively. yeah my, the, um, one, of my, one of my favorite philip seymour hoffman before i inter- i interrupt you mark is that mission impossible 3 and there because there's a great scene where he's talking to tom cruise and there he's like being hung out of a plane and he's just like i'm gonna do you have a wife i'm gonna kill her and it's just like mm-hmm. oh he's he's really like legitimately really great mission impossible 3 well, mark sorry mm-hmm. is that the worst mission impossible uh, movie no, Mission Possible 2 is. I mean, okay. Yeah. Um, just sort of back to the score and also like when I was talking about the filmmaking, it feels like the film in itself is an extension of Barry's character. Just the way it's shot. And like, think back to the, uh, the long take in the apartment where he calls the, the phone sex line. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you know, it's, it's him pacing around the room or sitting in a chair. When he's sitting in a chair, it's, you know, camera still, and he's sort of like, there's time to reflect. And also like, it's the camera just sort of like, without any motivation whatsoever, it swivels or like uh, it pans uh, to show him in a different corner, uh, which I thought was interesting. And then, but when he gets on the phone and he's talking and like you yourself are getting anxious about it because you know he's making a, a big mistake calling this phone sex line because it's clearly a scam. The camera's handheld. It's like, it's like, you know, just sort of shaking slightly and um, it just matches sort of the, the anxiety of the scene. And it's just these, these moments of tranquility and then uh, anxiety and explosiveness. And that's, I guess this sort of circles back to, you know, why, like why I love this film. It just feels alive. It yeah. feels like the film itself is buried and it just, yeah, it's, it's so great. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, go think, I think uh, you mentioned the use of color earlier and that, that was something that after the first 45 minutes didn't really notice, but then there's a lot of use of kind of like shadows and characters kind of becoming silhouetted in shadows while the background is kind of really um, bright and vivid. And that's when I kind of clicked. And then I, I kind of, after I watched the movie, I went back and rewatched, like a couple of scenes where we kind of we get introduced to Barry and it's very much the uh I mean he's dressed in a blue suit and then uh Lena's dressed in a red outfit yep. kind of contrast and there's like sometimes like deep purple kind of and it's just there's a lot of really great kind of like visual colorful moments there's one part yeah. in the movie that I laughed out loud super hard at and it, it was one of my like hardcore Henry laughs uh, what oh, do you guys gosh. think it, what do you guys think it was oh wait let me think is it like, a, like physical um, I will not. I will not. You have to get. It's a hardcore Henry style laugh. If you guys don't know what that is, hardcore Henry is uh, the first person action movie, and I'm a, I'm a I'm a loser. So I often would just like sit in the movie. I just giggle. There's a part in the movie where I just kind of like outwardly just like gawked, or gawked or whatever. Yeah. Gaffod. Right. What? Gaffod is that the word? Gaffod. Yeah. Do you guys want yeah. me to just tell you? Yeah. Just tell it's us. When, it's when remember. he's running away from the brothers and he like dolphin dives over <laughs> a railing. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. And, the, and the ground just looks like it's like 15 feet below and then it gets, and the camera's in the same place and it gets up. And he's just like, oh, and he's making like Adam Sandler, like happy Madison noises while running. It's like, ha, 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 and like running. And I was laughing. That, that, yeah. like, that's not it really subtle, like humor like Matt does, but that's the more slapstick. Yeah, yeah. But man, I had so much fun with that. I yeah, was, I was going crazy on that one. Yeah, yeah um, Henry laughed. You got skittles. <laughs> and you, went, you spilled them all. No, I had ice cream, but I dropped some of the ice cream and I was laughing. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's yeah, but... movie too. <gasps> what kind of ice cream? Chocolate chip cookie dough. Yeah, so did I. What really? <laughs> yeah, we have chocolate chip cookie dough here. I put some syrup on it, and I was I was enjoying well, I put it. Syrup on it. <laughs> uh, that was awesome. All right, Mark, what were you saying for me? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah podcast. Back... Yeah, yeah. Back to the the colors of the film. It's it's really it it really stuck out to me on, on this third viewing. It's just it's basically just white, blue, and red, and um, there's so many like. Here's an example of this. Like when when Barry resolves to go to Hawaii, he's in his he's in the warehouse and he's like walking out. And as he's walking out of the the white warehouse, white walls, uh, he's in the blue suit. As he turns the corner, a, a gigantic red truck passes with him. You know, that's another, uh, that's like one instance of, that I'm talking about. And then another thing is Lena's apartment building. White walls, red panels, the exit signs are in blue letters. Um, Interesting. Yeah, I didn't know like, that. Yeah, yeah. And, like, and then like when they're like in Hawaii, um, the people who are like singing and dancing, they're dressed in red. It's a blue, you know, pale blue uh, evening and like, you know, there's the blue, red, white, and like white tables everywhere. And then also he gets on the plane. He's in the blue suit, white shirt, golden tie. When he gets off the plane, he's wearing a red tie. Uh -huh. I thought that was interesting. I don't know where the red tie came from, but. Um, hey, you go, Mark. But yeah, I was much more aware of that. I, I think like in the first couple of scenes, I, I was like, I was aware of the color scheme of the film on my previous viewings. And I was like, oh, maybe I should pay attention to this. And so it became glaringly obvious as I watched the film. And, you know, you get those instances in the film where it's um, just the colors flashing on the screen. Yep. Yeah. At the beginning, it's blue, and then it's, like, blue-red. And then at the end, it's, like, half, like, the top of the screen is, like, red, and then the bottom screen is blue. It's, like, even. Okay. So it's just bringing these colors close together. That, that was the only part that felt kind of like, like college filmmaker. 
certain elements. I don't know, like the, like the random, like it was, it didn't bother me or anything, but like it just, it was just there. Like like the yeah. color montages, like they didn't, they yeah. didn't detract from it, but they just felt a little unnecessary. Huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Matt, what and else? Then, oh, also, also the blue lens flares. There's yeah. a lot of lens flare in this film. It's like watching a J.J. Um, Abrams movie. I know. Paul yeah. Thomas Anderson, J- we, uh, that's our weird comparison for the day. 2002's Punch Drunk Love versus 2009's Star Trek. And 2007's <laughs> Spider-Man 3. He didn't direct Spider-Man. Oh, yeah, oh yes, yeah, and Spider-Man 3. Comparison to earlier. That's right. That's a good point. That was the most surprising. So we have proof that Spider-Man 3 is a better script than Punch, Punch Drunk Love. <laughs> yes, we have proof. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave. <laughs> hey. I own I own both of those movies on Blu-ray, which means that's not something to brag about. No, it is absolutely. Well, original Star Trek is good. And Spider-Man no, I, 3 I is the best Sp- Spider-Man movie. I own Spider-Man three on Blu-ray. And it's the best Spider-Man movie. It's Spider-Man two. Uh, yeah. Amazing Spider-Man. Amazing Spider-Man. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. That's not a oh, bad okay. movie though. It is didn't, a bad movie. Didn't didn't Roger Ebert give that a four or a three Wait, or something? Yeah, he gave it like a ridiculously high grade. I'm gonna look that up. Matt. Like, I love it when the when our police officer turned to lizards. <laughs> 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 that's when he was. That's God. when he was uh, going senile a little bit. That's when he was in his older age. Yeah, <laughs> those are his last words. He probably thought it was like a really art house film. It probably like shocked him a little bit. He's yeah. like, it's so art. There's like one yeah. really good shot where he uh, where they where they line up all like the scaffolding things. Yeah, cranes, and it's like it's like and then like can't, like it comes down and it's like Spider Man and it's like all these lights, like that's like that's like a pretty decent shot, Mark Webb. Yeah, I'm gonna look up his review for that. Matt, what are some other things you didn't like about this movie? Because you, I think you're probably the least, you're the least fan of it. That doesn't make any sense. You're I thought you were Tyler. <laughs> no, I, I I enjoyed a lot of it. I just had problems with the relationship. Matt. I don't really have any more pro. Like it's a pretty short movie. I think we've. I've kind of aired yeah. my grievances. I, I like I like a lot. Just um, I would just say it just didn't it, like it didn't have like that huge impact that I think Boogie Nights had on me. That's mm-hmm. that's like Boogie Nights is such like an exceptional movie that I can't really expect any movie to have like that kind of impact. Um, mm-hmm. um again, I just I just real I really really changed my opinion on this movie watching it the second time. Um, I was pleasantly surprised by how much like I understood it more and I just, I just vibe with the tone a, a lot more than I did the first time and. Mm-hmm. Um, it's definitely one that I kind of want to rewatch again because um, I feel like I'd probably pick up on even more of it with like, uh, again, with like the music cues and stuff. Again, like maybe if I had a complaint, I just wish that some of the other characters were more developed because when you think of a Tom Sennett's movie, you think of extremely well-developed ensemble cast. And yep. This movie was kind of just more of a focus on Anna Sandler. So like, I, I don't know, maybe that, but um, again, it's, mm-hmm. that's not really the point of the movie either. So I can't really. It feels like, mm-hmm. he, it feels like Paul Thomas Anderson really needed breather after Magnolia. Feels like oh, he's, yeah. just like, he's like, I just need 90 minutes. Um, I just want to point this out real quick. Uh, he gave The Amazing Spider-Man a three and a half out of four. And he Roger, gave- what are you doing? Ready, in his review, it says, the best of all Spider-Man movies remains Raimi's Spider-Man 2, 2004. All right, we Roger got the Ebert, He's verdict. a genius. He's a genius. <laughs> he knows what he's talking Fake about. Fake news. It's ignoring yeah. three and a half out of four stars to Amazing Spider-Man. We'll have to do an amazing. Uh, we'll have to do a Spider-Man like extravaganza podcast. You and, you and Alex are doing your Spider-Man two rant. It's not a rant. I love that movie. That's Alex's rant. Well, Alex will. Well, I mean, you you'll pretend like you'll, you'll try to <laughs> justify the two and a half hours of of a gaslighting relationship between <laughs> Mary Jane and <laughs> Tobey Maguire. All right. Um, speaking of really great movies, what's one of the great scenes? Hallmark scenes. I was trying to do a better segue. Speaking oh, of uh, Marks. Move favorite. Speaking of Mark's favorite movies, let's get into our Hallmark scenes. There you go, Matt. Oh, okay. That's still, okay. This is bad. <laughs> um, scenes. Our favorite have, scenes of the movie. I have five. I five. All right, run them down. I'll, let's do this. I, I I'm just gonna list them off because I feel like we all probably have the same ones. Odds are, so we can just all talk about it together. So I'll list the five off now. Um, the the work site scene where everything's happening. You know, the forklift crashes. The sister yeah. is. Uh, the, the the sex line woman is calling and the sister's bothering Barry and then uh, Lena's there. Uh, that's one. Um, you might guess, you guys might not uh, feel the same way about me on this one, but I love the scene where uh, Barry and his coworker go to the, to the grocery store to get the healthy choice pudding. And he's just sort of like, he's like yeah. dancing through the aisles. I just thought that was so great. He grabs the entire like shelf of the yeah. pudding, like the stand. Just yeah. starts, just starts running. Um, Barry fighting off the four brothers, uh, obviously. Yeah. Um, B- uh, Barry's, Barry's phone call with the mattress man. 
where he's like, I'm Barry Egan for you. <laughs> that was that was awesome. That might be my like my penultimate scene. Um, and then uh, that's, that's Barry's conference scene of any of any PTA movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Barry's uh, confrontation with the mattress man. That's the last one. Yeah, I would say my favorite scene is the forklift scene. Um, just because it all leads yeah. up to that really brilliant and, and, and quick joke of the, yeah, everything okay? Yeah, okay, yeah. back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just love that scene. Um, uh-huh. I think technically it's probably the forklift scene because you get all the sounds and everything and the overwhelming yeah, sounds. Yeah. But in terms of like personal enjoyment, it's the phone call Philip Seymour Hoffman just because I love when they're just, just yelling at each other. And he's just like, no, yeah, yeah. fuck you. And he's like, you don't tell me to fuck you. will say fuck you, fuck you. And they're just yeah. arguing. I- and I I was yeah, it made me miss Philip Seymour Hoffman because like this yeah. guy's the best. I say my other hallmark scene is when the when like the the manager at the restaurant like brings him over. Yeah, and he's like really polite. He's like he's like, sir, did you did you the, the bathroom is completely <laughs> torn apart? And he goes, yeah. I don't know why you're telling me. That was me. me. He's like, that wasn't he's like, me. Like, so your hands bleeding. He's like, well, I, I cut I cut myself with the knife. He's like, he's like, so you're telling me that you didn't just destroy the bathroom in there. He goes, no. He's like, sir, your hand is bleeding. But he's being very polite. And then, and then, yeah. Dude, the restaurant goes, crap goes, sir, I'm going to break your effing face in if you don't get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> but like, but like the way he delivered it was so brilliant. Cause he's, he's still yeah, like yeah. polite, but there's like the sternness to him and you believe yeah. it. I don't know. I, I just, that actor did a really good job with like, how like how like the manager just kind of took charge, but yeah. was acting, yeah. was acting polite at the same time. That, I, that delivery I, then was brilliant. I also want to point out that when they left the restaurant, Literally everything is blue except for like a red light at a gas station. Really? You were just having yeah. the time of your life. And, and, and. Oh, it's blue. The, the, <laughs> the <laughs> there the was a, uh, the map in Barry, Barry's office is outlined in red and blue markers. I saw reason. that and I was, I, like half of it's like red. I did not yeah, get yeah. that. Yeah. I don't know why. I don't know why either, but it, like colors, I guess. <laughs> this is, that, his like whole thing to get like frequent flyer, frequent flyer miles was actually like based off a real person. Like someone really did oh, really? $3,000 on pudding and got 1.25 million frequent flyer miles. Wow. But, like that's just awesome. Matt, that would have been- You gotta buy some pudding. I know. But <laughs> you gotta go. Uh, yeah. Um, my homework seems probably all that. What do you guys, low points. Mark's sleepy time. Uh, Mark's sleepy time moments. Basically Mark falls asleep in movies. Um, not really. And then we'll wake up and then give him great. <laughs> I know that. So we just, it's our, instead of our lowest points or our least favorite points of the movie, we just call it Mark's Sleepy Time. Matt, Matt Sleepy yeah. Time Moments. Um, <laughs> sleepy Time Moments. I have one. I don't think I have any. I, no, no real scene stuck out as being lesser than the rest of the movie, I would say. I would say that, um, we have problems with the script, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that there are any Sleepy Time Moments. If that makes any sense. I just think I, anytime, like, the relationship, is like together like anytime okay. they're and yeah you may you might you might have hit the Tyler likes more believable relationships like in la la land la la land is believable <laughs> matt mark can come to my defense what about your dreams they give up their I'm gonna, dreams i'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick with matt because i just want to i want to pick on you <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah yeah matt, keep going <laughs> no i i guess it's uh i guess that's probably the best way to put it is it might not be any I, I wonder i wonder on how many tinder dates tyler started breaking out in song thinking that the leave. girl was doing with him like, like a model like, land. It's like, stars. <laughs> like, what are you doing right now? I no, had... but like, but like he's, he's coming up with his own songs <laughs> in his head. He's like, it's a wonderful night in Hudson. <laughs> he's like, I don't know what you want me to say. I had like, one. Do you remember on the show Phineas? Do you remember the show Phineas and Ferb? Yeah. There's a song, Ain't Got Rhythm, where they're like jamming at the library and it's like all in rhythm. I had that come on the radio once when I was on a date, and I don't think the person was very sad. They're like, "Beast and Burb." I'm like, "It's great." <laughs> that did not it did not go well. Uh, all right, guessing game. Matt, hands up, hands up, Matt, hands up. I'm not gonna look. I'm not gonna look this time. You I promise. Care. You yeah. promise. You have to yeah. do this for me. Yeah, I promise. Okay, I only have four, but I'm gonna look up the box office. Um, when Barry punches his knuckles on the wall and cuts his hand, what does the blood on his hand spell out? Does it smell like? It spelled something? Spelled Ooh. out, yeah. Um, Is it tied thematically with the movie? Yes. Anger. No, love. It says love. Mark. It's actually love. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's love. How'd you get that? Because I remember, cause I remember you guys talking about the love-hate thing in the, in the, um, 
Night of the Hunter. Night of the Hunter review, and I did, like I did not look that up. I knew it said love when it was written on his hand. Oh, I didn't know. That's cool. That's really cool. Yeah, that's uh, was it? That's the um, Night of the Hunter, and then that's did you, did you look up a trivia, Tyler? Did you know? Or did you see that when you were watching? That was like trivia because I pointed uh, it out. So and I'm the I... one who noticed that. Wow, I'm so cool. Matt, you suck. <laughs> um, I don't need the okay. internet. Is this the first Adam Sandler movie to get a positive review from Roger Ebert? Yes. The first Adam Sandler movie? No. No, yes. it's not. Uh, um, no. It is. Technically. What? So Which, I, 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 have, I have the list. I, and I, I looked this up because was. it's the first positive. Even though there's one that's questionable, I read the review and it's not positive. Happy Gilmore, he gave one and a half. Really? The Wedding Singer, he gave one. What? Yeah. The Water Boy, he gave one. That he one gave, surprised he me. He gave The Amazing Spider-Man three more stars than The Wedding yeah. Singer? Um, he gave Big Daddy, which I will die for. I like that movie. One and a half. He gave Little Nicky two and a half. Wait, he two gave, and a half isn't, isn't considered a positive review? No, I looked that up. It's not, apparently. He gave Mr. Deeds one and a half, and he gave Punch Drunk Love three and a half. It's his first overwhelmingly positive Adam Sandler review. I'm surprised he gave, like, I really like the water boy. Like I'm surprised. The water boy. All right. How many of Barry's sisters, he has seven Seth. in the movie are played. <laughs> shut up. <laughs> are played by actual actresses. Four. Well, I, I, I noticed, I noticed that they all looked really alike. And I was like, what are the odds of them all being actresses? So I, so wait, Four. what's, wait, say the question again. How many are actresses? Matt guessed four. How many of Barry's sisters are played by actual actresses, not unprofessionals, like not actors? I'd say I'd say four as well. Only one was played by an actress. Oh, and I believe, Lynn Reich of his, his, Yeah, the, yeah. the main one. And then she's in I twenty four. That's how I know her. Yeah. And then yeah, uh, I knew from twenty four as well. She's in Always Sunny too. I oh think, yeah, that's right. She's in Always Sunny. She's, she's um. Sunny? Oh, what's her name? Gail. <laughs> she's Gail the Snail. <laughs> Gail the Snail. <laughs> like they're salt <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Um, I was going to say, yeah, I think four of the sisters are related is why you thought they all look together similar. Okay. All right. So we know that this is Paul Thomas Anderson's shortest movie, and we know that Heart Eight is his second shortest movie. What is his third shortest movie? Inherent Vice. No, that movie's like two hours and five minutes long. Oh, really? <laughs> I haven't seen it. Heart Eight. Wait, you said Heart Eight, right? Heart Eight's his second. What's his third um, shortest? I'm going to say... There will be blood. There will be blood. Phantom Thread. It's Phantom Thread. It's Phantom Thread. And it's shorter. Yeah. Phantom. Thread His first guess was an Aaron Vice. <laughs> yeah. <count. laughs> I, seen it. I assumed it was like if it's below two hours and ten minutes, then it's. It's basically it's that. it goes like Magnolia, Boogie Nights. There will be blood. There will be blood. Inherent Vice. The Master, the Master, which is like eight minutes longer than Phantom Thread. Phantom Threads like an uh, Phantom Threads one hundred and thirty minutes as a short. His third shortest movie is a is two hours and ten minutes. That's absurd. All right, budget and box office. What do you guys got? It cost five million and probably made like twenty million, fifteen million. Mark, ten million and sixty million because Adam Sandler has star power. Oh, true, that's right. I this movie cost twenty five million dollars to make. It what? made twenty four point seven million dollars. What? People did not see this fucking movie. I knew that. Okay, well, huh, I guess not. I just I sort of assumed that like, like remember when Uncut Gems came out and like all if you looked looked at the reviews like on a uh, like Rotten Tomatoes, everyone was like, I want to see this because of Adam Sandler, and it was like yeah. the most depraved movie I've ever seen in my life, and I'll never see one of one of his movies again. Yeah, I assume no. that it would be like the same thing for Punch Drunk Love. It made seven. It made almost eighteen million dollars domestically. No one wow. saw this movie. Like no, and the fact it also is surprising. It cost twenty five million dollars because it does not seem like it cost that. I also before we go to grades, I just want to throw out there's like a set of shots this movie that I love. It's when he's looking at the piano and it cuts to him in every different angle around him. Like you see the the mountains behind him or the empty street in the morning. I forgot about that and it looked really cool. Um, mm, that's cool. Yeah, grades. We go on an A, B, C, D, F scale. Yeah. Tyler side, we can't do pluses. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why. I thought it'd be cool. It's kind of fun, isn't it? I think it's fun. No, I hate it. Mark, what are you going to give Punch Drunk Love and why? I'm going to give it an A for all the reasons that I previously stated. <laughs> a for Adam? A for, sure. A for no, Adam Sandler. Adam Sandler, yeah. Um, for all the previous reasons, Matt, what are you going to give Punch Drunk Love? I'm give it a B. 
big old fat B for high B, high B, low B. Uh, it's like a mid range B. Okay. I am also gonna give Punch Drunk Love a B. Um, again, it's a B, and it's my least favorite Paul Thomas Anderson movie. I mean, what does that say about him? I mean, that's like mm-hmm. that's absurd. Um, yeah. it says you hate him because I hate him. He's an awful yeah. person. Yeah. 